G'day all you bloody blokes, all you bloody Sheilas, and all the bloody rest of yous. I want to have a conversation with you all about January the 26th, Australia Day. The day's undergone a fair bit of cultural upheaval in recent times, and it's been subject to a bit of consciousness raising, I think, for many Aussies. It wasn't too long ago that many of my white Australian comrades were quite content to pack up their fucking esky and head down to a barbecue, festooned with shit cold snags, content to listen to Triple J's Hottest 100 and pretend to enjoy it. Oh, hang on. This is the really good song. It's really good to hear it in the Hottest 100, particularly it's such a high number. Now that's actually really fucking shame, because come on, Triple J's Hottest 100, mate. What are you? Why are you pretending to enjoy it? Good to have a day off with good tunes that we selected as a community. The music that reflects our generation and generations to come on Australia Day, the only day in which that can happen. What also happened since around 2015, for many young Aussies in particular, is that the internet called. And it brought with it politics and a revitalised culture war. Now that last clip was of Melbourne's 2018 Invasion Day rally in the CBD. The event was organised and put together by a tonne of different groups, including Warriors of the Aboriginal Resistance. But the event was effectively hosted in 2018 by my mate Celeste Little. Now, Celeste is a legend, and as such, many people heeded her call, with around 50,000, some say up to 60,000 people, heading into the CBD. And that's, of course, more than any fucking patriot rally that there ever will be. Jesus fucking Christ. Now, people were heading in because they understood the importance of acknowledging invasion, and acknowledging, more importantly, the survival of what's proven to be the world's oldest surviving cultures. People are clearly paying attention, but, as a lot of you seem to want to have some sort of day to celebrate Australia, this is clearly an important conversation to be had. So, onto the practical consideration. What should you do on Australia Day? Grab your magic flag cape, or your magic flag thongs, or your magic flag flag, or your boombox, or your esky, or your megaphone, and head on out to one of the range of events that aim to celebrate Australia Day as it currently is. And we've got a range of events under that category. We've got boomer grade head in the sand events, like government sponsored hand flag waving parades, through to youth grade head in the sand events, like embarrassing Triple J barbecues for people who don't really have any beliefs. Mate, this is Australia. We don't apologise for nothing, except for good times with banks. Cheers. Sorry. Right through to the other end of the spectrum, which is fuck off we're full grade ultra-nationalist hate rallies, organised by and for the worst Australians of all time, who are really keen on stealing credit from whatever they decided that their ancestors have done. Now, if option one really appeals to you, then we've got option two for you as well. Another bit of sick escapism. The new Dragon Ball Super movie will be being released that week and it'll be airing on a limited run in selected Australian theatres. Though I'm yet to confirm which language the film will be being screened in, it does offer you an opportunity to relive your childhood, waking up and watching Cheese TV. You might as well consider this, my friends, because frankly, paying respects to Goku and friends a galaxy away is just about as realistic as the prospect of paying respect to the notion of Aussie pride offered up on Australia Day. In fact, my friend, Going to an Australia Day parade to observe that garbage and pap is about as realistic in its observation of Aussie history as is going to the new Dragon Ball movie to solemnly observe Goku and friends and to salute their power levels and energy balls and shit. So why don't you go on, patriots? Go to the Dragon Ball movie and salute the fucking Dragon Balls. Ah, oh, Star of Milton, give me fucking strength. Stop with this fucking bloody lefty Chinese Japanese shit. You're not going to the fucking Dragon Ball movie. 
that was my old mate, the Five Flag General. He's the leader of Australia's best uh, ultra-nationalist patriot group, the Million Flag Patriots. Please always attend my videos for a, a rich survey of all white Australian attitudes from, you know, despicable leftist traitors like me right through to the best nationalists the country has ever seen, like the general. Good flavour, Todd, and cunts burn up! Oh, you fucking cunt, oh, fucking... Oh. You can heed the call of the times and head out to one of the many events organised around Australia to solemnly acknowledge what January the 26th really commemorates and also to celebrate the survival of the world's oldest surviving cultures. Now, many of my white Australian brothers and sisters are surprised to learn that it ain't all mourning and rage at all of these events. There's actually quite a celebratory tone at a lot of them meant to celebrate the survival of the Indigenous First Nations peoples of Australia. That's why you see the words Survival Day also bandied about. And not all of these events are referred to as Invasion Day events. So there's those events for you to look into and attend as well. Sorry for this, sorry for that, sorry for fucking everything. Why don't you get the lefty cut out of my fucking videos so I can have a yarn with me patriots? Salute everyone, it's been a little while. He's all gone. Why don't you just give me back a salute or two? I have been brought into this video to talk to you about what to do on Australia Day because I'm known as an intellectual and a somewhat middle of the road political moderate. Thinking about the best option as to what to do on January the 26th, I would suggest option one, specifically some of the organised hate rallies being organised on the day are looking pretty good this year. Look, not really my business, but I think okay, as long as it's dubbed into English. You know, I hate to say it, but I think that anyone attending any one of those other fucking rallies should probably be, let's be reasonable, shot in the fucking face by the Australian government. Thank you. Now, when considering what to do on Australia Day, the notion of pride is often pinned onto many of those who want to celebrate Australia Day as it is. And then the notion of shame gets pinned onto the people who want to do things like attend an Invasion Day rally or uh, enjoy one of the many Survival Day events that are organised. Oh, I'm sorry! I'm sorry for everything! <laughs> I'm sorry I'm white! No, please! I'm sorry I'm white! <laughs> and then, in the middle, a chorus of bamboozled Aussies. Can't we just have something what we can celebrate for something? Can't we just have something to celebrate? Just something? Well. My exhortation to you, dear viewer, is to look at our history and the totality of it. Yes, dating back to 1788, but also with an open eye to the millennia of human history that predates it. Let's take a clear-eyed view of our history together, shall we? And see where that takes us. Come on, I'll be as brief as I can. In the late 1700s, we British settlers, and remember, if we're really going to own our history, then we have to consider their history as ours. Rocked up here on an express mission of expansion. The invaders who rocked up here were in very late stage, refined colonial expansion. We'd already perfected all the tricks of non-negotiation, displacement and violence that benefit an expansionist regime. By then, we knew better than to sign treaties. No such fairness. We dehumanised the locals to make it easier for ourselves to try to kill them off. We displaced them. We slaughtered them. We wanted to erase them and to erase their history. They resisted. For over 100 years, the locals fought war all over the land. These are the frontier wars, and they are the only war fought on this continent. We struggled over 100 or more years to adjust to this place, 
ruining the environment with aggressive expansion, war, importing out of place European farming practices and endless cattle that destroyed this land's soft soil. We were hopelessly arrogant, inept and wasteful in assimilating to life here. But we made it our dumping ground for British convicts and our colony, nevertheless. By the late 1800s, we decided we wanted to stop the Chinese coming in to mine what we thought was our gold. We created policies and laws to allow only white Europeans to join us in barging in. White Australia legislation was our first drafted upon Federation in 1901. We even made amendments to those laws to discriminate, even against white Europeans. So we decided we didn't want Southern Europeans, for example, or Jews. Italians were the Chinese of Europe. We were brutal to migrants. We set up sham tests that undesirables couldn't pass in order to turn them away. They interfered in the homogeneity we decided was important for our colony. As the 1900s progressed, we began to concentrate on the displacement and theft of children. We wanted assimilation from the original inhabitants of this nation. We stole children from their mothers and isolated them with white missionaries, families and schools. We were trying to erase their bloodlines and in so doing erase history. It was still important to us to exonerate ourselves from judgment by erasing all the evidence of our cruelty. Sham race science and eugenics was thoroughly rejected in the 1940s by scientists. World War II happened. The British Empire had stared down the barrel of being subjected by Nazis to the ruthlessly authoritarian imperial occupation that they themselves had visited upon much of the world, including Australia. The West finally had to draw a line in the sand against ethnostatism, eugenics and white supremacy. The term genocide was coined. The United Nations was formed to try to prosecute crimes of genocide and foster international standards of peace and harmony. In that changing global climate, oppressed peoples began to negotiate towards equality. And campaigns like the US Black Civil Rights Movement sent shockwaves around the world. Australia became aware that we would fast become an international pariah if we didn't do something about our treatment of the First Nations people of this continent and our stance on immigration. We finally enabled voting rights for Indigenous peoples in their land in the living memory of many as recently as 1965. The Whitlam government effectively ended the White Australia policy, and then Malcolm Fraser, a Liberal Party Prime Minister, allowed in a huge intake of Vietnamese. Australia was consumed by its magnanimousness and patted itself on the back through the 80s, with a dogma that was at first cultural and later institutional. Australians came from everywhere to give this nation... Agencies were formed to forward the human rights of minorities, but sadly, many of them tossed indigenous rights and migrant issues into the same bucket. We were all very pleased with ourselves. But it turned out that you can't just dump a world of migrants into Springvale and Cabramatta and expect them to thrive off of the fumes of your generosity. Vietnamese migrant communities were starting to experience problems. These problems were difficult to solve quickly, but easy to convey in profitable media pieces about gang crises. The continuing cultural climate of recognition of Aboriginal sovereignty was heading towards a natural, just and tangible conclusion. Land title claims. In this climate, we saw the 90s deliver us our John Howards and our Pauline Hansons. They led a return to our insular white Australian dreams, like a rubber band stretched too far and snapping back into its original shape. They wanted us to abandon the institutionally multicultural 80s vision of one nation. One nation of migrants and indigenous Australians bowing and scraping in gratitude to the white settler benefactors. Abandon that one nation and snap back into one nation.
Come on, let's all be one nation and have a good sing along. We are one, but fucking many. Fucking lands on the fucking fuck. We share my dream. I sing with one voice. I am, I am, I am Australian. Very good, salute, fucking yeah. We have to understand. And when I say we, I mean white Aussies like me and other assorted imports. That unless we can reconcile ourselves with the unvarnished modern history of this nation, as well as the much broader history of the oldest surviving cultures in the world, then we, as whites, are doomed to never assimilate. We cannot trick ourselves into a kind of a false national pride by ignoring wholesale all of the fundamentally dishonourable shit that our British settler ancestors did to occupy and take over this place. Oh, you as an Aussie might want a barbecue and a hottest 100 for some fucking reason. Guys, guys, come on over and listen to the hottest 100 with us. Pl guys, please come now. But there is no pride in forcing one's head into the sand. The truth is that the land was never ceded. There was a very long and bloody history of wars fought all over the nation. And that's documented. They're called the frontier wars. They're the subject of political football and have been for years. But that doesn't mean they're not real and bloody. In a more informed world, perhaps they would be the first wars that would come into your mind when you say, lest we forget in April. Perhaps in a more just world, you might say, lest we forget on January the 26th. But there's no tribalism or culture wars in simply remembering things as they are. It is not unpatriotic to embrace real history. Now, I'm no nationalist. <laughs> and the word patriot doesn't exactly roll off my tongue. But it is my honest belief that the only authentic path through to a real Australian nationalism anyway, would lie through embracing this true history head on, instead of deluding yourself. The only realistic option if you want to commemorate anything real on the day is option three. Hey, let's all stop acting like weird, rude European tourists and selfish daydreamers and all have a Realistic look on what we should do on January the 26th, hey? Option one, celebrating the day. Well, we've established that that's all built on lies and illusions if it doesn't incorporate a solemn remembrance of our true unvarnished history, right? And so all of the parades become distractions. The hand flags are all little distractions you can hold in your hand. The barbecues are all distractions. The ultra-nationalists are all compulsive fucking liars. Every snag you eat is like a sedative. The fucking flag has a Union Jack in it for God's sake. And the hottest 100 is fucking awful. And it's not even on January the 26th anymore anyway. So I feel a little bit rude, unnecessarily so perhaps, continuing to attack it. But hey, it was always on that day and it was always awful, right? The world is changing, my dude. Get out there and show some fucking respect to the world's oldest living culture. Go to one of the Invasion Day events. Attend a Survival Day rally. Get out there and show some respect. Be part of something real. Stop all this 1788 head in the sand celebrating a failed attempt at genocide shit. Option three. Option three is the only way. Or failing that option three and then option two after. Bit of Dragon Ball afterwards. Not my business, mate. Do what you like. Free bloody country. Look, it's fucking January 26th. We're not going to a fucking movie. Stop it, you fucking leftist. Fucking get him. Government Australian government. Shoot him in the fucking face. Do it.